<clears throat> so open source enterprise. And uh, yeah, the no seriously is because um, I think most people think it's a misnomer that that's even possible. So we'll take a look. So first, who this guy is asking you about what you had for lunch. Um, I'm Big Blue Hat online and all the places that I got to first. There are maybe a couple others in some places. Um, it used to be my business and I kept the brand because it stuck and at conferences people knew me better as that because I tweeted as that name. <laughs> I'm an Apache committer officially as of uh, like two months ago, I think. So that's been nice because I've been in the CouchDB community for about six years. Um, worked for all the CouchDB companies in that time. Um, 14 plus years doing open source. Do any of you know what Apache Cocoon is? Sweet. That was like my favorite project in like 2000. And I built this huge website. It's an XML XSLT um, content management framework. Still around, still got a decent committer base. It's actually still really cool. It has this concept of pipelines. And uh, it's basically like you chain a bunch of Java functions together. And uh, generally, you're just processing XML and outputting HTML at the end. But it could be JSON. It could be whatever. Um, and I really liked it, but I lost my appetite for XSLT at the end of that, because that's most of what you wrote in. And some things were really, really hard in it. Other things seemed quite native. But so open source enterprise. Um, as mentioned, that, that may seem like a misnomer to a lot of people. Enterprises don't act in the open, generally. Um, but here's some, you know, just a smattering, the famous ones, of places that enterprises have contributed and contributed heavily, often to the point of creating some of these. Um, on the right side, there's open source foundations. Not really, Linux Foundation is a foundation, but Linux is a huge space in which enterprises have been very heavily involved. The Eclipse Foundation, obviously. Uh, the Apache Foundation, of course, is why we're here. And then Outer Curve. Who knows what Outer Curve is? Yeah. Microsoft, create, you've heard of them probably, created Outer Curve out of CodePlex, which was like their .NET code sharing space. And it was called the CodePlex Foundation, became Outer Curve. And uh, Jim Jag, who's well known in Apache circles, um, also serves on their board in some capacity. I'm not gonna say what, because I don't know. But he's been involved in leading that ever since Microsoft turned it over to the community. Um, so then on this side, we've got standards bodies, and the list is longer. And it, it's not uh, exhaustive because there's loads more. And enterprises do really, really well at uh, standards because apparently that's what they're good at. Better at standards than at source. And there's a reason. And that reason is this. They collaborate. This is like kind of antique, 10, 15 years, and maybe longer, of this mode of doing business with other businesses. So you collaborate on the specification and you compete on the implementation. Thanks for coming, guys. Come grab a seat. And I, I'm going to apologize to all of you in advance who've already heard this in the hallway. And I appreciate you helping me get my slides done. And uh, you really haven't missed much. Let's, I'm going to skip over a lot of this. I like CacheDB. That's the title. Standards bodies, right? Because this. See, not much. So yeah, they've been collaborating on specifications. Um, and a lot of those standard bodies groups is where that happens. Um, not always within a group, sometimes just outside of those. But usually, they stand up another brand to handle the specification, um, come up with shared licensing sometimes. Other times, it's just wide open. But for the last 15 or so years, they've been competing on implementation, which is why back here, this, whoop, this open source list is shorter in one sense than the standards list because the mode has been to collaborate on the specs but compete on the implementation. So most of, for the last 15 years, the implementation stayed in-house. The standards were open. It was kind of the shared space. Let's all use Phillips head screws, you know, whatever. Um, catching back up. So that's not exactly community over code, right? Like, they haven't actually shared a lot and they're not actually pushing they're not actually pushing a collaboration that goes beyond themselves, right? They're keeping all the, the stuff inside. And, and open source, in that same span, sort of obviated the need for closed source, right? Innovation moved into the open. 
source just kept coming and kept coming and we kept getting better and we saw Linux and things outstrip stuff and be the basis for Android and all kinds of things. And these collaborative bodies aren't really collaborative. There's a term that um, I've heard coined called co-opetition and it's cooperating with your competition and that's basically what happens in the standards bodies, right? They get in there and they like hug each other and they both have like weapons at the same time and they, they just crop the photo really tight so nobody sees that. But a lot of times these standards will come out totally to attack another vendor, right? So Big Co A, I'm not gonna use company names in here by the way. Um, you can ask me who I work for later. Um, so Big Co A um, has a standard and, and builds a consensus around it. And then Big Co B wants to get in the space, right? And they have a competing standard that's been proprietary historically. So the way to attack the incumbent is to do what the incumbent's doing, but do it better or with a different crowd and maybe outnumber them. So they enter the space with a new spec that's very similar, or they slow them down by joining the standards body and asking all the hard questions all the time and, and making standards take 10 to 15 years. Like, it's not just because people have been lagging on implementation of these specs, it's because this co opetition model actually just engenders strife a lot of times and they don't actually get a spec that anybody wants anymore because they diluted it on purpose because in the meantime, they're selling proprietary software based on a competing spec or um, an enhanced version, right? So this is kind of the core proposal that I wanna make today and then there's implementation details in the rest of it uh, with some reasoning. So collaborate on specification and implementation but we should compete and implementation, right? That's the change. Open source is already doing that. And there's spaces where that's happening, right? Eclipse, Apache, Linux Foundation, all of that. Um, that's already happening, but it's happening more and more. And I think it's only gonna accelerate. So now there still needs to be a place to compete because capitalism. So compete on service and delivery. And this is essentially what the cloud has gotten us, right? Big air quotes around cloud for me anyway. Um, or the as a service model, right? as a service, I even put it in the thing. And delivery would also be the, the as a service aspect. So it's how you're getting the product to people, whether that's through an app store. I've seen a lot of open source products available for purchase in the app store. They are open source and they will say that in their description like, hey hacker, this is open source. If you wanna go download it and fork it and do whatever you want to, go for it. But if you're just you know, somebody's mom, you pay 99 cents and get the app, right? And, and then I'll go keep coding on this. Or if you're just a do-gooder, then please, you know, pay me 99 cents and I'll keep iterating on this if you don't feel like forking it or contributing, whatever. So there's all kinds of different delivery models. And the service aspect has been in the open source water for a long time, right? You want a support number to call, you want a head to slap, you want somebody to blame, you want this to go smoothly through your procurement office. Procurement doesn't pay zero, right? They've been given budgets and they want a big co-name on what they're buying because they have bosses to answer to to say like, look, this is how much we spent on the awesome stuff we did. And if it's zero, that doesn't look good. Like you got somebody's free stuff, like we're running this company on free stuff, like that, that doesn't go over with stakeholders. So people will still pay for big company software, even if it's like equals, equals, equals the Apache version, really. Like at the end of the day, they're still gonna buy the brand, right? So there's, Oh good, you guys can't see these random tweets that are coming up. Thanks for whoever's tweeting. Um, all right, so I think it's time for the next major point release in open source. And here are some reasons. Um, I don't know if you've heard of this book, but I think we should all read it. It's, um, well, our bosses should all read it, and their bosses should all read it. It's uh, 56 pages. It's like one, one decently long airplane flight. And, um, it's been covered in Read, Write, Web and Wired and all over the place. And in this book, Stephen O'Reilly of Redmonk says things like this. Developers are now the real decision makers. Learning how to best negotiate with these new kingmakers therefore could mean the difference between success and failure. And I think we've got now 15 plus years of proof of that. And that power has been growing over time and it's very much there. Um, and that negotiation can start happening in the crowd, in the development community, as we put forth other ways of getting stuff done that don't buck a commerce model and say like, I'm gonna go all the way with the uh, Free Software Foundation and say like, 
it's just all going to be free. And you can only come up with strange business models. No, like we've got new business models that are working on open source. Like it's already proven, right? We do this every day now. It's, it's classic, but there's still all kinds of restraints for how developers do that. There's all kinds of policy and there's all kinds of issues. <clears throat> so here's some spaces where it's already been proven. Cloud, big data, mobile. These are popular things, right? So many of the leading technology areas, such as cloud, big data, content management, and mobile, content management's a personal favorite, are treating open source as their foundational platform. So says Michael Scott. This is in the results of the Black Duck survey that came out on Friday. It was very timely. It's also why my slides weren't submitted yet. Um, there's several quotes from that thing in there. Um, it's fabulous. I, I got rid of other quotes and put these in, because um, they do nothing but back this up. So open source has built the foundational platform already for cloud and big data and mobile. Um, it's already there, right? It's proven. We just point at it and say, well, it worked here, right? Let's just keep this going. Like, if you don't want to stop this good thing, don't stop it. We'll, we'll make it go really well. This is the next, you know, this is the new kid on the block to re-reference a keynote from earlier. Um, the Internet of Things is the mashup of big data, cloud, and mobile, right? It's everywhere. And if this is actually going to happen, Michael Scott again says, further, more new areas like the Internet of Things, which requires interoperability and extensibility, can only be met, only be met by open source initiatives. So he has a horse in the game, right? He's in the All Seen Alliance, which is a, another standards body, open source thing, group of collaborative companies, hopefully, that are pushing standards for you know, your dishwasher and your chair to communicate over TCP IP or Bluetooth or what have you. Um, and it has to be done this way, Michael Scott and I, I guess, not to like get his credit, but um, a lot of people believe it needs to be done this way because we've proven the model and we've disproven the other model that held back other innovation by keeping it behind closed doors or in the tangled co collaborative air quote space of standards bodies and slowed down the process of actually shipping product. And we've moved to the open source model of just get it out there, get it in a liberal license, let's get it shipping, let's make the thing, let's ship the thing, let's see if the thing works. If the thing doesn't work, then we kill the thing and we keep going. And companies make delivery and service money all the time on top of these open source things. And it's even leaking into hardware, right? We've seen that with the Raspberry Pi, mostly open source, other, other components, other uh, projects fully open source, so it's only going to continue. And the more Internet of Things devices that people conceive, the more likely these small shops especially are going to go with this model. And enterprise can leverage those same tactics, right? They can leverage those same abilities and make even more progress even faster, and we can stop dragging our feet. So open source in the enterprise exists, right? We just looked at some of it, um, but it's not really an open source enterprise. So there's some distinctions. I misquoted this to somebody in this room last night because, you know, it was last night. Um, it was, I said 80%, it's being optimistic maybe. 50% are expected to be doing open source. So doing, right? It's, I'm not quite sure what entails in that. It's in the open source survey and perhaps there's more footnotes. Um, Doing, I suppose, includes all kinds of capacities, like contributing to donating large quantities of allowing developers to work on it, whatever. So 50% are expected to. That also doesn't mean that they are, because then there's this ugly number, right? 30% of them actually make it easy for employees to go do that, right? Um, there's long, drawn-out processes to get it approved on and off the clock. It can be tangled. Um, you work here, we own your head. Et cetera. That's old. That's the old style of doing it, right? So 30%, sadly, they don't say who actually make it easy for enterprises to do this. Um, of friends surveyed at different companies um, before and during this conference, um, most of the big co's in the room don't have policies that really make that fluid. Um, somebody not here said that his GitHub just died the day he took a job at a very particular big company not known for open source of any kind. And um, it just stopped. And you can see it on his GitHub page, right? There's like green and then nothing. And 
and it's, it's not been anything for like two years. And prior to that, it was doing all kinds of stuff. And he got hired because of all that stuff he was doing, right? Because they could see it. And so it stops. And then now he's going to take a new job, and it's already starting, right? So there's this visible progress that not only he's making, but his employer attributed in, which he did change, I think, on GitHub to say, now, now I work for this company, and that's why I'm not doing anything here. Like, that's awful. That's awful for him, and that's awful for his employer. So now his new employer is going to get all kinds of credit when he shows back up in all these spaces being awesome, and he's a really nice guy. So it's actually more like this in the enterprise. Enterprise is doing open source. It's marginally collaborative. Maybe it is. Maybe, there, maybe there's some good companies. Um, it's closed by default. That's not necessarily a problem, but that's just what it is. It's competitively open. I mentioned that with standards. Like, there's a, I don't want to mention names. There's a, there's a product out there, and it's gaining traction, and we have a similar thing that's proprietary. Let's open source that and just cause a mess in the marketplace. Well, OK, well, there's these consumers, right? And they buy stuff, right? And they want to be happy. And they'll go with whoever makes them happy. So you can piss them off and all fight, and then a third guy is going to come in. Or you can collaborate, and we can put the fighting behind us and keep going. OK, I'll, I'll keep dreaming. Um, and then there's this tagline, right? Who knows who that was going about? Come on, somebody? Yeah? Can you, you just shout it out. No. Microsoft? Is that something? Right, right. So, and lots of things, right? UDP, TCP, IP stuff. They made all kinds of extensions to all kinds of things. And uh, this is actually a direct quote from some email that got leaked from inside of Microsoft. It's on Wikipedia. I'm quoting a known source, right? If you disagree, go change it. Um, <laughs> so there's some variations. I don't know which one was actually in the email, because apparently that's not online anymore. Um, but embrace, extend, and extinguish, or exterminate, or whatever. Annihilate with an E. Um, so sometimes that's what's done, right? We take the thing, and we, we extend it, and we make it better. Sometimes that's, that's the proprietary thing that we sell, right? It's the open source stuff plus a bit more. And OK, that's fine. But other times, it's we forked it, and now we're in this space, and we're just messing up collaboration. We're just being that rude kid at school causing problems, right? for whatever reason. Um, and, I, and I think it misses the point. Because the word that I keep using with open standards and open source that you might have picked up is the word collaboration. Not coopetition, not competition, actually legitimate collaboration. Because to me, that's the most beautiful thing that I've found in the Apache Software Foundation in any open source project I've ever been a part of is that we've all come together to do a good thing and to make something awesome. And that's collaborative. And I don't get that. I haven't gotten that in most of the places that I've worked in the past. I can send you my LinkedIn list if you want to see it. Um, it's just because it's not there, right? You'll, you'll get it, maybe. Maybe you have a great team that you work on it. It's collaborative, all four of you, right? And, and what are the four of you going to do in this proprietary product that 400 of you couldn't do better, right? And couldn't be more amazing. All right, we'll come to why there's the disconnect because of scarcity and everything later. So how do we fix this? Um, well, first, how many of you think it needs fixing? Maybe we should pause here for a minute. All right, I've got a biased crowd. There's a few that don't think it needs fixing. That's good. Um, let me bring up a quick chart that I didn't get in. Hey, this is maybe going to work. Um, yeah, this will work just fine. Sorry, guys. Give me one second. All right. Yeah, look at that. Oh, sweet. All right. You can see some of this. Um, tribal leadership. How many of you have read that book or listened to it? Ooh, you all need to go do that right now. It's free. Um, Zappos, shoe company. Right? They sell shoes. Nothing really incredible. Um, but they came out with this book called Tribal Leadership. And it has these five stages of the tribe and how it progresses. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to look at this because it's not on my screen. So there are these uh, stages of the tribe, this category here. And then this is kind of how you feel about it. Apologize for it being cut off. And uh, this is kind of the percentage of where things are at. The most profitable companies, there was another chart that I don't 
have visible, um, are in these two categories, despite the percentage being lower. These are the ones that, for the number of employees, happiness index, blah, 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 they turn over the most money. So what you see happen in this chart is what the movement of the person in that tribe and how they feel, right? So you start down here, and it's me versus everybody, right? So that's not collaborative at all. And then you move up into this, um, into these two stages where you or your group are against other groups, right? And this is, this is this stage here where you have a tribe pride, and you've got a bigger group, right? You've got a standards body over an open source project, but you're still throwing stones at other tribes, right? And then you get up here where the whole planet is like a giant team, and we're actually out against a problem, right? And then everything, everything twists, and it's all rainbows and unicorns. <laughs> You, you laugh. I'm serious. No, what? Do what? I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes, there is. Yeah, right. I forgot about that. Yes, uh, Ted continues to amaze me. Um, but yeah, look that up. Tribal leadership should turn up all kinds of good stuff. Um, so sorry that wasn't in the slide deck. But that's essentially the foundation of this, that if we got to the place where we're actually here to solve a problem, where the enemy is not somebody else, either person to person or group to group or company to company or country to country, and that we're actually attacking a problem. And it's all of us, whoever we are, even if we don't think we should be involved, we consider everyone to be against a problem, be that cancer, be that whatever. Yes? Sure. I think Apache is not. I think the projects within it can be, but don't have to be. Um, I was in a talk this morning by somebody in this room where his research foundation, he's back here in the corner, Reto, um, had actually taken the time to get several Apache projects that didn't currently work together but were doing awfully similar things um, and sent patches to each and kind of made them closer. And, and actually made them depend on each other in some ways. So it's, it's totally doable that we should be, but there's also some tooling problems with collaboration. Like some of us were talking about the other night, like if you wanted two projects to collaborate, where do those projects go and discuss it? My project. No, 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 my project. Like you can't even have the conversation, right? It's like, where do we talk about this? So yeah, there's tooling problems, there's things we need to discuss about how that happens. But mostly within it, the, the tension of competition isn't usually just you're doing the same thing I'm doing. It's you're taking something that's scarce, right? That's kind of the foundation of capitalism or commerce, to move it farther from any volatile terms, is that scarcity is the only thing you can sell. It's the only thing that you can make money on. I can't sell the air because it's abundant, right? You can sell water because I can make it scarce. Um, so anyway, scarcity. In those earlier slides, I mentioned that we can, i just bring it up, that um, changing from the old model of competing on implementation, the reason to stop this is because implementations aren't scarce anymore, right? Code is abundant, and code's only going to be more abundant, and implementations of concepts or vague things are increasingly abundant. Social coding at Apache and GitHub and everywhere have made that true, so now, the scarce things are these two guys, right? Service and delivery, how I get it, and whether or not I like getting it from you, right? Um, so there's, there's all kinds of analogies we could use or whatever. Um, but we'll skip down here and maybe come back to a, a proper set of questions at the end. Um, okay, so, whoop. all right, this is going pretty well. How do we, like, how do we fix that? Um, only 30% of the enterprises actually make it easy for this to happen. So presumably what that means is it does happen for 30% of the people, and it's maybe easy. They don't define easy in the, in the results of that survey. But presumably that means if I want to go help somebody on Apache project, whatever, I just ask. You know? And there's some of you that I've talked to that it sounded really easy in your company. And there's other people I talked to and was like, oh, well, I had to wait you know, four months. You know? And it's not. This isn't, so okay, there's all kinds of scenarios, right? There's, I'm in enterprise, big code, whatever. 
and there's this product that we've had for two decades, and I personally think it should be open source, right? Okay, that's a non-starter. You're not gonna just take it and take it out, and that shouldn't be easy, right? That's, that's like the lifeblood of loads of people, and there should be long processes and discussions about is this strategic, is this whatever. But when you wake up at 2 p.m., 2, 2 a.m. in the middle of the night, and you wanna go open source some random piece of JavaScript, shouldn't, I don't think, need to ask somebody about it, right? You should just go do it, you should go contribute. If there's an Apache bug at work or off work with whatever project you're working on, and it's frustrating, you should be allowed to fix it, right? Like there's no risk to anybody in you doing that. It's just moving everything forward at a faster pace and benefiting the enterprise in the end because source is abundant. It's not the scarce thing. The scarce thing is not the JavaScript you just typed, really. And it's not ideas either, but that's later. All right, so this is the Kool-Aid I drank back in December that kind of started this. And I submitted the talk sometime after that. How many of you have read this book? Yeah, all right, so that's good, it's about half. Um, this is a pivotal book in so many ways. And a lot of what he, uh, Eric S. Raymond, who apparently was in the crowd at the lightning talks, um, or so somebody said, um, actually did was just codify what Linus had done with Linux. Right? He said, this is why it worked. I tried what Linus did with fetch mail. How many of you use fetch mail? It's still awesome, actually. Um, I, I, he wrote that up. I tried it with fetch mail. Here's why it was a success. Here's how it was a success. Here's other businesses that use it. Um, he, he's gone back and added like chapters at the end um, for Netscape at the time. He was part of helping that happen. Um, and really proving the point that the cathedral model, well, which I should probably define, the cathedral model and the bizarre model are just two different ways of coming at a problem. The bizarre one has proven itself now. When he was writing this, it was still like super young and, and whatever, but we've had 15 years of watching the bizarre in many ways out-innovate the cathedral. The cathedral, in his example, actually isn't, as I thought when I opened the book, Microsoft versus Linux, right? This is Windows Linux. It was actually GNU versus Linux. Because, and I was like, what? This is like open source and they're fighting. I'm confused. Um, but it was the fact that there was a very top-down structure and a very like, this is how we have to do it. Um, there, were, there were BDFLs in both groups, so it's not like a pro or anti-BDFL, a uh, beneficent dictator for life sort of thing. But it was how encouraging the community was and how collaborative it was towards iterating towards an, a common shared purpose, right? And he has all kinds of fabulous quotes, like this one. A happy programmer is one who is neither underutilized nor weighed down with ill-formulated goals and stressful process friction. Enjoyment predicts, predicts in, eh, pred, I'm gonna start over. Enjoyment predicts efficiency. Um, how many of you have seen that to be true in your own life? Like, at work or at home or anywhere, right? If you're happy, you get in this like weird zone, right? And everything else kind of disappears and you are late for dinner or the, the meeting you were supposed to be on or whatever because you're getting something done and you're having a good time. So there's this fabulous video that was mentioned um, in the keynote on Monday, as were a lot of these ideas, um, by the RSA called Drive. It's one of those awesome whiteboard videos where they draw and talk at the same time. Sorry? Is that the one where they talk about Atlassian? Uh, yes, it is the one. They, they talk about Atlassian in that. And um, they're 24 hours of like do whatever you want for a day, right? Which is pretty awesome. Um, they also talk about Linux, surprise, surprise, and the Apache Foundation and Wikipedia as collaborative models for making awesome stuff that have done things that enterprises had been trying to do for a very, very long time and failing. And the crowd got there first because hordes of happy hackers showed up and stayed happy and they kept going and it's, it's awesome and it's a good little 10 minute watch. Um, but there are three factors for that staying happy bit, right? There's autonomy, which is personal task selection, which is not something that sounds like the enterprise, uh, but it could, there's no reason process couldn't change. Um, there's mastery, there's leveling yourself up is what I call it, because I play games. Um, or, or helping others level up, right? That, that's the mailing list, right? I'm lost, I don't know how to do whatever. Well, this is how you do it. And I'm so glad you're here, 
Like, I'm so glad you asked that. I'm so happy to help you. Now you're more awesome. Please stay, right? Please stay on my project, and eventually you can contribute, and we want you to do that. And there's this path towards, like, not the end of the game, but here's all these achievements you get along the way, right? You get to be a committer, and you get to be a PMC member, and you, you know, whatever. In whatever project, there's always something like that. I'll send you a t-shirt, I don't know. There's lots of options. And then there's purpose, like why am I doing this? Why did I join this project? What do I want to build? Why did I, whatever. And the best projects with the healthiest ecosystem and community have that, they have that baked in. And I'm pretty sure I'm running out of time. When does this end? Two, 150? No, 205, we're good. All right, so does any of that sound like the enterprise? Maybe your enterprise. I'm sure it's awesome. So another ESR quote, it may well turn out that one of the most important effects of open source's success will be to teach us that play is the most economically efficient mode of creative work. I have a seven-year-old, and this is strangely true in his life. It's been true in my life, but it's amazing to watch it happen, right? So um, he's been in lots of different educational environments. I'm not here to discuss education. Um, and in the ones where we could align his interests with his enjoyment and play, right? Play, can, play is work, really. If you ever watch your kids with Legos, like, it's hard work. So whenever that was aligned, he would come away with just like loads of knowledge and, and be excited to continue to level up, to go on to the next thing. And I'm gonna make this, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna learn the uh, Atlantean conlang, right? In the movie that we just watched. And I'm like, okay, great. Here's your spelling words. Can you write them in Atlantean? Go. And okay, I'm done, Daddy. All right, awesome. Let's go do some scratch, right? Because he's having fun. And it's like, as long as I point him in the direction he needs to go without hurting himself or just not actually making progress, um, he continues to learn. And I didn't, I didn't have to tell him to do that, right? I didn't have to say, like, go learn, go be smart, go, go do this, get, get back in your seat and teach. When I do that, it stops, it's over, right? Like, finish your math. And it's like, I don't wanna do math. Now, there's a balance, right? You gotta kinda push through that. And we'll talk about parenting another time. But when he's happiest and enjoying the thing he's doing, and sometimes it's achievement-based, right? Like, if you get this, then we'll go to the, the board game store and buy another Pokemon pack, because we play Pokemon together. Um, if you get this math speed test done, so that, like, okay, the thing itself is hard, but now there's a, a thing in front of this that I can plow through to get. Okay, whatever, lots of motivators. So one of the major ways of facilitating play, both for children and programmers, very similar things, is by removing worry, right? So when my son is stressed about music practice or whatever, he, uh, he, d he doesn't play, right? He's like, I've got to do this by this time. And, and with the math speed test, it's the same thing. Like, I've got to beat the timer and I can't think, right? But when it turned into this exciting, like, superhero type thing, it was fun and he got it done and he enjoyed it. So here's some worries that I think the enterprise can come with. Some do, some don't. Um, what happens to the stuff I make at work? Is it going to just die? Are they going to decom all my products? Am I going to be moved off to something else? I, like, I love this thing, right? I'm pouring blood, sweat, and tears in it. And somebody else is going to kill it. Who decides if it's good? Does the market decide? Does my, my current boss maybe who I like? Or my new boss who I don't know anything about? Or his boss's boss's boss? I have no idea. Um, and can I bring me to the work? Is that a safe place? Can I come here and just play and like bring all my creativity? Or do I have to like notch it back and be like, I'm not sure I wanna tell you about this thing because I don't know what you're gonna do with it. Like I don't know if I can trust you with it. And that's, that's worry and that slows down play and creativity. Um, should I keep my ideas out if I'm that worried about it? Should I like try to experiment over here? And is that even legal? Like can I even do that? And a lot of times it isn't. Um, technically or otherwise. So fixing the enterprise employment contract, this is the big ask, right? This is the blue sky. You can all just tell me this is a, a dream and, and we'll move on. So, and the goal here is to facilitate play. So ICLA in this case is the Apache um, Individual Contributors License Agreement. As it turns out, most big companies that in my research I could find use this with external 
contributions already. Apache has set like this really solid model for enterprises doing open source with other people. So employees are people too, right? So what if they signed individual contributors license agreements in their employee contracts to their employer? So let's take a look at what that would mean. The employer owns the aggregate copyright. As I understand it, Jim, throw rocks at me if I'm wrong. Or, or just tell me. At all. Okay. Right. Right. So that that's what I mean. Like Apache CouchDB as a whole, right, is the copyright of Apache, correct? But my contributions, I still own the copyright, and you got a license, right? So that's essentially what the ICLA grants. It's a grant of license and a grant of patent. We'll get to that scary word later. Um, so there you go. So the end result, is that legible? It's quite tiny, I'm sorry. There we go. Um, the employer owns aggregate copyright to projects it creates. An employer, in your experience, is Apache. Just kind of replace those. Um, the project then by the company is donatable if they ever want it to be an Apache project, but they start it in the open on GitHub or their own SourceForge thing, that's fine. Um, or Project Allura, right? Um, it's commercializable, right? Sorry for all the dashable words. English kind of stopped iterating at some point. Um, so they can still make this a product, right? Just like they do with Apache stuff. Um, they, they still have the ability to ship an, an equals, equals, equals proprietary version. Um, but again, their, their best opportunity still, I believe, is on service and delivery, right? It's not the actual implementation. The point is somebody else is going to implement it anyway. If you did it in the open, you're going to get all the street, street cred. And if you bring an army of nice people to take care of me while I use it, I'll pay you for that because I want somebody to complain to on the phone when things break. Or my procurement office needs your logo, whatever. Um, and the project is company branded. It's, it's the companies, right? But it's, it's all in the open. And it's totally, because of that, movable, I think, into the Apache Foundation because they own the aggregate and they have all the ICLAs signed over by both internal contributors and external contributors. So the employee, this is where the removal of fear and stuff comes in, has no loss of identity in their work, right? I made that patch. I'm in the author's doc on this project for my employer. Um, it's like those gigantic Adobe splash screens from the 90s, right? And like you just click it and it was like, oh, there's just names and names and names of people. Or the end of Pixar movies, right? Like 300 babies and all their parents. Um, it was just amazing. Is a lot of people go into these projects. Um, yeah, <laughs> we could start a baby's file in projects. Anyway, um, so meaningful credit for contributions, like that often is a problem in a company, that you'll do something awesome and it doesn't get recognition. And maybe one or two people above you do get the recognition. And that's demoralizing. It's, you can get into the right and wrong of it easily, but it also means that the more that happens, the less likely I am to keep doing good stuff at work. And the more likely I am to actually leave and go somewhere else that will let me do good stuff at work. So it's motivated also by a meritocratic value inside and outside the company. Like the company sees my contributions. You can look them up in the subversion control system. And everybody on the outside sees that I work for this awesome company, right? I don't just wear their shirts. I actually have made the thing better. And in what way, right? So then it's not just the company's cred, it's the company plus all these people that are known entities within the company doing awesome stuff. And you want to go see what awesome they're doing? It's right here. And they're known everywhere, which only makes the company's brand bigger. OK, so open by default. The reason to do that is for building community. Let's uh, channel ESR one more time. While coding remains an essentially solitary activity, the really great hacks come from the attention and brain power of entire communities. So I mentioned the scale difference between any company, big or small, versus an open source set of brains on a problem, right? And what we're finding is that, you know, with the more eyes, bugs are shallow, right? <laughs> I'm not making that up. Um, also in the same book. And no company is going to employ as many potential hackers as there are 
in the open source world, partly because their competitors already employ a lot of them, right? And if you were doing that collaboratively, you would all be fixing these shared problems that you're all trying to fix and maybe the consumer's not happy with any of you, and that's actually quite likely. Um, and it's also quite likely that they're not happy with the open source one that's wandering around too. But if we were all in to fix a problem, whatever that was, that's a lot of eyes on a lot of bugs that suddenly become very, very shallow, far more shallow than they could be internally. Perhaps in the end, open source culture will triumph because the closed source world cannot win an evolutionary arms race with open source communities. So I mentioned cloud, I mentioned big data, I mentioned mobile, I mentioned internet of things, right? Those are all built on this foundation of open source communities, like heavily and increasingly. That is the evolution, this was written in, I don't know, 89, 90 something, no, 90 something. I should look it up. But that was a long time ago, right? So we've got like 10, 13 years since this statement was made, and it's a proven thing now, in my opinion. When you start community building, what you need to be able to present is a plausible promise. A lot of companies do open source, but they make no promise about it, right? Hey, look, it's our source code. <laughs> Great. <laughs> is it gonna be there tomorrow? Like, if I bring up this page, will it have gone away? Like, I better go fork that if I have any interest in it, because it might not be there, right? Or if I contribute, what are you gonna do with it? If I don't, you know, like, I don't understand you, you're too big and amorphous and scary. So here's some promises I propose that the enterprise make. Is that helpful? All right, that's bigger. Purpose motive, um, here's what we're building, right? These are the things that should be stated with any company project. Here's what we're building it, here's why we're building it. Like this is our intent, just straight up. We're trying to fix whatever. There's a lot that needs fixing, right? We're trying to fix interface for such and such. We're trying to fix how people do such and such. If you're interested in that, come help us. Like this is why we're here, we're here to fix this. And, and even, you know, if they're really open, they can say, and here's how we intend to make money on it. Like, we're gonna do this, and then this, this is our product offering. These are, this is the phone number that you can purchase a, to call. This is the uh, support line. This is the uh, license that you would get on top of this. These are maybe some additional features that we do to make it feel even nicer, right? These are the mater d's that you get at this nicer restaurant, even though the food is exactly the same. We're in this together as well. <clears throat> proving to the communities that the company is here for participation and not to just um, make slaves out of. And you can trust us, and here's why. Um, they have to be more than just idle words. Um, trust phrases are used all the time by companies, and they're rarely believable. And to the point that it's diluted, right? You hear that from companies, you're like, yeah, that's marketing. Um, but like, <laughs> But it shouldn't be that way, right? I, should, I want to trust you. You just have a bad track record. So if you give me a statement, usually with the larger, the larger the company, the more paperwork you expect to have back up any statement they make, right? So here's some written promises. Oh, here's an organization that keeps its promises, I think, has for a long time. And here's their related paperwork. Mm -hmm. So community over code is not a license, right? It's not something we signed, but it's something that's baked into all of these. It's baked into the Apache license, it's baked into the incubation process, which is essentially a document, living or otherwise. How you get in there, why it's important, what's the, what's the promise that's being made. We don't let anybody out of incubation because of this promise. Like, we promised the world community over code, and this is why you're going through this process, because you have to prove that you agree with that and that people will trust you as part of Apache and trust that we keep that promise, right? The ICLA and CCLA are like necessary things to make that happen, okay? So here's some enterprise promise topics in general. Copyright, continued openness, um, what's the exit strategy for the project? That would be great to hear, right? You know, we're building this and we're obviously selling something on top of it, whether that's service, whether it's proprietary, whatever. But if we decide to decom this, this is what we'll do. We'll either donate it somewhere or we'll leave it up as on a website for X number of years, or you have until this date to download and fork it and whatever. But we're not just gonna disappear and take all the bits with us. Um, so lots of options for that. And then patents. So yeah, I said that. And yeah, so that's from the EFF. 
Um, so there's this guy, right? It's a, it's a markdown file. <laughs> it's the innovator's patent agreement come up by the uh, bluebirds at Twitter. And here's some quotes from that. Company agrees not to assert any claims of any patents unless asserted for a defensive purpose. So patents are one of the scarier things in creative work anywhere, right? And especially in software, because in software, it's vague, it's fuzzy, and there's lots and lots of angry mobs that attack each other in this space. Um, you know, that guy, right? He's not a happy guy. Um, so what the Twitter Innovators Patent Agreement says is that we're not gonna go beat anybody with this patent. However, if they come and sue us, we will use it to fight back. It's defensive only, but we will defend it, right? So to do that, um, sorry, back it up for a minute. To do that, the in, it's, a, it's a pretty classic intro to this agreement that the inventor gives it all to the company, right? It's, it's theirs, it's their patent, right? So they can defend it, they can do whatever they want. It's kind of the flip of the, the CLA, right? The CLA is I keep my copyright and I give the Apache Foundation a license to it. This is the reverse. So I'm going to give uh, an employer that agrees with this, I'm gonna give them my patent, essentially. They'll reference me on it just like they would on any other patent. And it's theirs, though. It's their patent because they, they have to own it to use it the way patents work. But this is what I get back, right? Assignee, which is the company, hereby grants to the inventors a perpetual worldwide non-exclusive royalty-free license. That sounds like the CLA, right? It is. It's just the flip side of it. So I, as the inventor, can go work on this, right? So I'm, I'm at wherever has signed this with me. Again, I'm gonna keep trying to leave company names up. And I'm inventing for them all day long and they're patenting my stuff and I'm, yeah, that's great, let's keep doing this. Whatever, thanks for the check. Um, and then whatever, I'm like, this is a really wonderful idea and I wanna go work on it. Like, those, uh, those others were great and I made the product great and that was fine, but like, I'm so in love with this, I just wanna work on this all the time. Okay, go do it, right? We're not gonna stop you. If you get really good at it, we might buy you, right? It's unlikely that one inventor and even a bunch of VCs is actually gonna do any collateral damage to a large enterprise that the enterprise couldn't solve in a different way than bringing large armies of lawyers to attack each other, right? They could just say like, thanks, come back. <laughs> you know, welcome back. It cost about the same. Or, or they could fund it or whatever, but it would make progress. And especially if they aren't using the patent, that would be super awesome. So this license to the inventors is not assignable, although the license shall pass to the heir of the inventors. I have kids, you know. So, you know, for kids. How many of you have seen Hudsucker Proxy? All right, that's what that's for. Anyway, um, I thought that was cool. I didn't really see that coming, but I thought that was kind of neat, you know. Like, I have grown up wanting to be an inventor my whole life. And for the better part of my life, I was in love with patents. I was like, someday I'll have like this big stack of things I made and there's proof, right? It's all this paper. Um, and, and part of that was, you know, my kids will be the sons and daughters of this great inventor. You know, it's pipe dreams, but whatever. Um, so that was neat and it made me happy. And, and that facilitates play, right? They have just removed angst. They said like, we're only using this defensively and you get a copy because you made that, you know? If you really want to go do business, most inventors don't, so it's pretty safe. But if you want to go do business around this thing, you, can, you personally can do that, or your son, or your daughter. You know? They can pick up the torch if they you know, get tired of hearing about it every night at dinner. So thank you. That's it. Um, if you have questions, I think we're out of time. But if you have questions, I'll take a couple. Right, so the, the CCLA, Jim's gonna be the better answerer here. So the question was for the tape, um, how does the com corporate copyright relationship work with the Apache Foundation, right? Yeah, and then the product keeps evolving, right? Right. original copyright, evolution of the product Here. Can we get this?
can't take it. Oh, one of the reasons why there have been issues with um, um, uh, the way Free Software Foundation and, and GNU projects are is that when you submit code, you submit your copyright. You, copy, you do a copyright assignment to them. So you no longer own that. So you really can't have that much freedom and flexibility on the stuff that you just created. You've got to, okay, I, I created this code. Uh, it's now owned by you. You have the copyright. Therefore, I need to abide by your license. You can't say take that and then license it separately because you no longer own what you have. So that's, you know, that's the, the difference between a copyright assignment and, and you know, may, that's the reason why you would want to maintain your copyright. And so you can take what you have originally and then do whatever else you want with it rather than what the person you've assigned copyright to. Yeah, but then, then there's also, if the employees of the company continue to work on it, they've all signed ICLAs, and they're then operating under two contracts, right? Their, correct me, but their company copyright, and the company has given them license to contribute whatever they make to this project back, but that agreement is actually between you and the Apache Foundation. So they own your copyright, but they've given you permission to license it, and, and you are sort of this working piece in the middle. It, it, it is a little uncomfortably fuzzy to me um, because I, depending on the contract you signed at work and where you work based on that contract, like on their machine or your machine or in the building or out of the building, um, who owns it and the, you know, that's where it gets all messy and it's a worry and it slows it down, right? Um, but in effect, the committer's copyright is the thing that they care about. If you've sold it, sold it to somebody else for your paycheck, that's fine as long as they've given you permission to also license the code you made on their behalf to the foundation. Does that make sense? It's not clean, which is why there's this talk. And it's, but it's not not clean on the Apache side. It's very clean on the Apache side, in my opinion. The confusion's actually with the other contracts that aren't in the room. They're the ones that don't have URLs that you can't read, right? I can't show you mine, you can't show me yours. But I, we can all go look at the Apache one and say, yeah, that works. I can do that. Or it doesn't, and here's a patch, right? So this is a patch for the enterprise. I haven't found their uh, source control yet. All right, I think we're out of time. Thank you very much. Thank you.